Now, ready to Thanks. go. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here this morning, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Betis, for the presentation too. Very interesting, interesting work. Um, I, my name is Anthony. I'm, I'm I'm a PhD student at UCLA. So uh, Chris's colleague, uh, sharing the same supervisor, David Rigby, and the work that I'm presenting today uh, is uh, something that we co-wrote. It's not completely finished yet, but we have done most of the analysis. Um, so I, I'll welcome, uh, for sure, um, I'll welcome feedback on how to improve or extend uh, the paper. So, so this paper in general is uh, also on multinational firms, but, but we, we use kind of a broader term and we refer to multi-locational firms because we do not discriminate whether or not these firms have internationalized. What we're interested in is uh, firms that have establishments in multiple locations, whether it be, uh, in this case, within the same national economy, so within the United States. Um, so, so I will start with, with the observation that, that large uh, modern organizations have come to design kind of complex and organizational structures in order to take advantage of uh, geographical specificities. Uh, we know that because of an increased competition on the global market, um, firms are motivated to access new markets, to access new inputs, um, and to reduce their transaction costs, for instance. So the, the, the result of this is a complex structure where firm have, uh, firms have antennas in different places and establishments that will serve different purposes. And here's a very good example of that, actually. On this map here, we only look at, at one firm, so IBM, though a huge firm, and its locations in the United States and in Canada. Uh, there's over 600 establishments of IBM uh, in this part of North America. Of course, some of them are only um, offices, you know, like it doesn't mean that there's a lot of employees, but a lot of them are also uh, research labs. Um, you'll have the headquarters there in Armonk as well. Um, so you could see how expanded uh, some of these fir firms uh, have become in the modern global economy with this example here. Uh, now, the question of, of multi-locational firms, um, and by extension of multinational firms as well, has of course been of interest in economic geography and related fields, so in economics as well, and in international business, for instance, um, and it's been studied from various perspectives, of course. Uh, I will categorize these perspectives into two broad, broad approaches. Well, on the first hand, you could look at these firms and ask yourself, okay, how do these firms, well, exploit space and organize their value chain across different locations to build and secure their competitive advantage? Here, there's been a lot of work on the motivations to go to specific locations to exploit specific inputs. Um, and, and you have studies as well looking at what helps these companies internationalize, as Betts has just mentioned in his study as well. Uh, you know, so, so this is a one kind of big research stream on the topic. And then on the other hand, a, a lot of research researchers also look at how the activity uh, impact and produce local economies by investing in local economies and by exiting as well local economies, which could have a a significant impact on, on production. Um, these, these questions now have been integrated a bit more form formally in uh, studies of that. Um, we, you know, from in, in, in the economic geography literature, in the evolutionary economic geography literature, there's been, of course, a long run interest in studying how the structure of regional change uh, the structure of regional economies change over time through processes of diversification, for example, uh, with a lot of empirical evidence. But this work has overall tended to assume that capabilities that support these changes are accumulated within the regions rather than tied to specific economic actors. And this is where the theories of multi-locational multi firms uh, play a, a role is that more and more and very recently, some people have been interested in the role of these agents in fostering 
uh, regional diversification. Among others, the work on, on the actors uh, or agents of structural change. So in this paper, we engage with these broad issues of understanding the, um, how capabilities are built uh, for these agents. And we look at uh, the sources of capability involved in technological diversification in multi-locational firms in the US. Uh, more precisely, we engage with two more specific uh, kind of research streams uh, in this paper. One is more firm focused, the other one is more uh, region specific, uh, but let's start with the firm. Um, so we kind of adopt a, a knowledge base approach of the firm and assume that the specificity of the firm's knowledge is what generates heterogeneity on the market and hence it is a source of competitive advantage on the market. We know from this perspective that the knowledge of the firm is not static, but rather evolves as a response to contextual, or we could say environmental changes. That implies then that firms have to constantly develop new knowledge and new technologies in order to remain competitive on the market. And because the market is so competitive, it, it has become an incentive for firms to actually geographically expand, to expand their knowledge combination possibilities or to reduce their costs. So there's strong competition and this need to adapt to contextual changes has pushed a lot of firms to expand geographically to strength, strengthen or sustain their competitive advantage. Now, from a regional perspective, uh, a lot of the assumptions or theoretical claims are similar. Uh, we would say here that um, the first statement is that the hetero there's a lot of heterogeneity across regions, even some national regions, in terms of economic development, but also in terms of knowledge production and specialization. So the specificity of the knowledge stock of a region is also a source of heterogeneity spatially. Now we know also from this literature that uh, some forms of knowledge do not travel well across space. Um, and therefore this kind of heterogeneity will be sustained over time because knowledge will be locked in place um, for an extended period of time because knowledge and especially the more complex forms of it uh, do not travel well already. Um, and recently, this, this, as I said in the introduction already, this literature has, has started to look at, okay, what are the drivers of regional diversification? What are the drivers of sustained specialization, but also technological diversification over time in regions? And this work has looked more specifically then at firms and entrepreneurs. And uh, most studies actually have found that non-local firms or multi-locational, multinational firms are key agents of structural change, meaning that they are able to introduce new technologies and new capabilities um, in the regional environment. What we know from these two literatures then, I think that they come to a very similar conclusion actually, is that firms like regions, um, and, and we'll see how they interact, uh, diversify based on their existing knowledge base and capabilities. And there's ample empir empirical evidence uh, showing that. Now, this literature also has um, limits that we're gonna try to tackle in this paper. From a firm perspective, again, to start with, um, and I think, I think Betsis mentioned that as well, um, is that there's not a lot of systemic kind of large scale empirical evidence on the activities of multi locational firms and mostly uh, on the knowledge sourcing strategies of these multi-locational firms. It comes in part because of, uh, it is due in part to the relative unavailability of detailed and geospecific or geolocalized firm level data. And for the same reason, we don't have a lot of research done at the sub-regional level uh, because a lot of the financial statements are aggregated at the national level when we talk about multinational firms, it is very hard to actually know what's going on precisely in one specific establishment of these firms. 
the limits uh, pertaining to the now the, the regional perspective is that most of the literature in economic geography and evolutionary economic geography has focused on regional aggregates. It assumes that capabilities are territorially embedded and shared by economic agent, agents relatively freely, although we have good reasons to believe that it is in most cases or in many cases not necessarily the case, especially when the knowledge is complex and when the knowledge is a source of competitive advantage for the firms. And despite this recent growing interest that I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, the role of agent agents in this regional diversification uh, has remained under study. Um, it had, not only the, has it remained under studied, but also um, in, in recent papers, uh, the claim is that non-local agents have been able to or are able to introduce novelty in regional economies, but yet little is known about how these firms themselves source their capabilities to introduce these new capabilities in the region. All right, so we tackle these issues and these limits uh, in this paper, and we asked more specifically four questions. Uh, the first one, we look at these multi-locational firms located in some national regions, and we ask, do capabilities that influence technological diversification reside within the specific establishment, within the overall corporate network, or in the region in which the establishment operates? So we're trying to unpack a little bit uh, the sources of capabilities involved in technological diversification at the agent level. Now there's three kind of sub questions. Uh, first, we ask, do establishments located in more technologically dynamic locations benefit more from local capabilities than other establishments in other locations? Uh, subsequently, are there differences in capability so sourcing patterns between headquarters and branches? So uh, does the organizational structure plays a role here? And finally, do establishments build upon the same capabilities to develop technologies that are new to the firm? So we will distinguish between developing technologies that are found elsewhere in the corporation versus developing technologies that are new to the entire corporation, at least in the United States in this case. If I can uh, represent this in some kind of a diagram, this would be the theoretical model to answer these questions. So let's assume that A is a multi-locational firm with n number of establishments, in this case, four establishments. We're looking at the diversification uh, in A1, for instance. So it's at the branch level or at the establishment level. And we say that there will be three sources of capabilities involved in uh, technological diversification. First, uh, the accumulated knowledge stock of A1 itself. So it's kind of accumulated capabilities. The capabilities residing within the city in which A1 operate, operates. And the capabilities found in the other establishments of the multi-locational firm, in which in this case, A2, A3, and A4. You will notice that the cities in which these other establishments operate are not labeled. It's because that we do not integrate uh, other regional knowledge stocks in the model directly, but rather we will think of extra local knowledge sourcing through intra corporate uh, channels. If I apply this theoretical model to a real life example, let's look here at Ericsson in the United States. Um, and let's say that if we want to look at what is a diversification uh, at Ericsson in Atlanta, Georgia, all right, we will look at its, the effect of its accumulated capability here in Atlanta. Then we will look at the influence of the knowledge stocks, uh, knowledge stock of Atlanta, Georgia as a whole, and also add the knowledge stock of the other branches of Ericsson in the United States. Note that we only include in this uh, data, and I'll come back on this in a moment, but we only include establishments that patents and that patents in at, le in at least two consecutive time periods. Uh, 
So the establishments you see here are all establishments that have patented in at least two consecutive years in the case of Ericsson. Speaking of the data, uh, here's what we're using. So we first, we start with patent records, uh, patents as a proxy of, of technological production in this case. Um, since we're looking at the assignee level, so at, at the organizational level, there's a couple of chal challenges that we need to be aware of and tackle. First of all, in patents view, for instance, um, there has been some disambiguation of the assignee names. However, there is still a lot of messiness in the data. So for example, if I have Ericsson Corporation, I may also find Ericsson Corp and Ericsson Co. And these will be listed as three different assignees with three different IDs uh, in the patent records or in the patents view records. Um, so we need to first run some, do some cleaning of the assignee names, uh, which we did by using um, an edit distance between all pairs of assignees in the patent records. And we used the Jaro Wrinkler uh, distance measure to determine whether or not two strings are close to each other. If they are under the determined threshold, it means that it's the same assignee. So we regroup them and give them the same ID. The other challenge that comes with looking at assignees in the patent data is that the location of the assignee itself might not actually reflect where the invention took place. We know that a lot of firms will put actually the address of their patent office or their patent department or the address of their headquarters, for example. So we do not know from this whether or not the invention actually took place in the location that's listed uh, for the assignee. Now, if we look at the inventors, there's also some problems because if the inventor location matches with the assignee location, we can assume that the invention took place there. However, what about inventors that are located in other places. We do not know their affiliation directly. So we need to figure out if the other inventors are actually working for the firm, but in other establishments of the firm. Okay, so in, in like, let's say in Ericsson, if I have somebody listed in San Jose, but the location of the assignee is in Atlanta, Georgia, how do I know that the inventor is working for Ericsson if I don't have information about the establishments of Ericsson? And this is why we actually use a, another source of data um, and we gathered company records from Orbis. Company records from Orbis allowed us to identify all the locations in the US of these multi-locational firms. So therefore, is there's, if there is a match between the location of the inventor, the assignee name, and the location of, the, of an establishment of the same assignee, we assume that this inventor has worked at this establishment. This might reflect, this might be a limit because there might be cases where the inventor works for another firm in the same location of the establishment, but we still believe that it's a reasonable assumption to, to say that uh, the inventor is very likely to work at the establishment of the assignee. Uh, we know from Orbis as well, and I'm about to stop in just 30 seconds so we can talk about the theoretical model and the data if you have questions. Uh, but from, from Orbis, we also know whether or not um, the establishment is a headquarters or a branch. And we also gather information on inactive firms to make sure that there's not too much of a temporal bias in the matching. Of course, uh, we don't have the same IDs uh, organization IDs between the patent records and Orbis. Um, so this is why uh, we need to develop some kind of matching um, strategy and we operate a fuzzy matching uh, between the patent and the Orbis uh, database, once again, based on the Jara Winkler distance, which is best suited for organization names. It was actually developed by the Census Bureau for that specific uh, matter. And now, and also we link based on, as I said, location and establishment names. So I'm gonna stop here first. And if you have any questions on 
uh, either the theoretical model or the data. Yeah, I have two questions if I if I can. Um, Go ahead. So 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 very. I mean, just clarification question. Uh, uh, first, um, yeah, about the disconnection, you know, between, as you said, I mean, as you mentioned, between activity and uh, uh, um, the, the, the location that is, I mean, that you observe in, in your database. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if, um, because I, I mean, I'm just thinking about uh, incentives to locate your patents in uh, tax-friendly states. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if it was, if first, if uh, it is a big issue and it, I mean, there's a big disconnection and it could like uh, very distort what you observe. And uh, I mean, if it's a big issue, if you can somehow like try, I mean, if you correct it somehow. And a second question is uh, just a good question about the fuzzy matching. I mean, um, how well do you perform uh, when you do your matching? I mean, do you have a lot of matches at the end of the day or uh, today it's kind of noisy and you have to uh, explode like, I don't know, 40% of the original database? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you, Betsis. Um, so, so for the, the incentive to file the patent from a specific location, this is the problem with the assignee address that's listed on the patent record. And this is why instead of using that address, we use the location of the inventors because the inventors on patent records, they list their personal address, right? And, and, and so we know that these inventors that are located in a specific place actually performed kind of the invention, all right? So, so if the firm had the incentive to file the patent from a tax uh, friendly place or state, it, it would be listed, let's say in Delaware or, you know, uh, so maybe the assignee location would be in Delaware, but then when we look at the inventors, we would actually see that they are located in Armonk, New York, for example. And in this case, we can kind of control for that. Uh, now for the fuzzy matching, um, it, is, it is a bit fuzzy, you know, in the sense that uh, it is kind of a, a, a heavy process um, for each uh, specific, um, for each specific, step, I performed two rounds of fuzzy matching, uh, but, also, but also a bunch of experiments about, uh, on the threshold that I should use. So for instance, I started with a sample of, let's say, um, 10,000 uh, observations, performed a couple of rounds of fuzzy matching using different threshold. So different threshold meaning with a different distance threshold under which it's considered to be the same or similar string. Uh, and then at the end of these experiments, I uh, kind of determine a threshold that would um, generate uh, the le as less noise as possible. Of course, uh, fuzzy matching can never be perfect. And there's a lot of uh, string manipulation involved as well, because if, you know, since the, since it considers every character in the string, you need at first to get rid of a bunch of unnecessary uh, characters in the names. You need to get rid of periods. You need to get rid of the co of the ink of commas. Um, so that would be the first step. You get rid of the unnecessary characters and then kind of an experimentation with what, uh, what threshold uh, is best to generate as less noise as possible. But it remains not perfect. So then there might be some messiness here which is in part also, but in, in one sense, it would be controlled a little bit by if there's a match between the inventor's location and establishment location, uh, it controls for, for that messiness a little bit. Cool, uh, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you push ahead now. Uh, just FYI, I think you have about, let's say 20 minutes or so. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, perfect. Um, so here's the result of the matching. Uh, you know, I, I will not go into too much detail, uh, but but just generally speaking, um, here is the percentage of all assignees that are multi-locational firms uh, in our sample at the end, and there's here's the percentage of patents in in the U.S. in the U.S. PTO. So what we can see from this figure quickly is that uh, we have about a thousand multi-locational firms that we select at the end in the sample with about 4,200 establishments, uh, which represent about 5% of all assignees that have patented in the US, but 
or above 20% of all patents. So uh, they are very productive. Uh, here's a concrete example. Again, I took an extreme um, just to show you, uh, you know, how far it can go in, in terms of multi-locational uh, patenting in the US. Here we're looking at IBM and all the CBSAs that are colored here are places where there's an inventor affiliated with IBM and an establishment of IBM in these locations that has been listed on a patent. So we can, we can say from this figure that IBM has had inventors and establishments patenting uh, in all these locations, which is a total of 83 over the 15 year period that we're looking at. I probably forgot to, forgot to mention too that our uh, final sample is, all, is from 2001 to 2015 because before 2001, the, we're losing a lot of uh, uh, company information from Orbis. Uh, now going into the methods uh, for for this uh, for this study, then um, so so I'll come back on the model in just a minute. But first, I will say that we start by building a relatedness uh, matrix uh, showing the proximity between each class of patents that will be used uh, in the model and in, in multiple uh, variables um, a bit later. A lot of us are familiar with with these methods, uh, we're starting by looking at the number of patents that list the pair of co-classes I and J, for example. And so we have a count of pairs of uh, classes identified by a number of individual patents. And we standardize uh, these co-class counts by the square root of the product of the number of patents in each class. So what it gives us, the S here, uh, is a matrix that shows the proximity between each technology or each of the 652 CPC classes. This will be used now in the construction of the density measures that I will talk about in just a minute. Um, but for the general model, let's say abstractly, uh, we're gonna have more specific models in just a minute. Uh, but the general model then is that we wanna explain the development of a new RTA uh, so a revealed technological advantage, which is a proxy for technological diversification um, at the establishment level. This will be explained in the models by uh, the density, so the proximity between a technology that you might diversify in and all the technologies uh, in which each unit will have an RTA. And I, I'll give, again, more detail in just a moment. But, um, so proximity of the technologies uh, will be the main explanatory variable. Uh, we add to this uh, firm fixed effects and time fixed effects as well. The dependent variable in the model then is um, the development of a new RTA in the condition that this RTA at the establishment level was not developed in the prior year. Uh, we developed this RTA measure by looking at the share in an establishment of a class over all classes in which it patents over the share uh, of this class over all the classes in the population of reference. In this case, we're looking at all firms in all cities in the denominator, uh, but we also experimented with two other denominator, denominators, uh, sorry, uh, and the most kind of uh, Inclusive one is looking at a class share in the whole population of patents in the USPTO. Um, but this measure um, is not so we and we found that this measure is not very sensitive to the kind of denominator that we're going to use. For the explanatory variables uh, for the establishment level model, we have then three density measures. The density measures are an indicator of technological proximity. Uh, between the knowledge stock of a unit and a, a class in which uh, a branch or an establishment uh, might develop an RTA in. Um, so at the establishment level, for example, it would look at all the classes in which the uh, establishments, establishment has an RTA times the proximity between these classes and every 
of the 652 classes. All right, these you can think of these 652 classes as potential classes in which the branch might diversify. Now at the firm level, um, we're looking again at all the classes in which the corporation as a whole has developed RTAs times the proximity between these classes and all 652 classes. And same for the city level density measure. Okay. And so maybe I'll stop here for, for questions on, on these measures, yeah. Yeah, so there's a question on the chat box that I'll read out to you, and it's how do you handle pat, uh, patents with inventors in multiple locations? Uh, it will be distributed um, to different locations uh, by with, with their share. Um, so let's say if there's two inventors in San Jose, one inventor in New York, the patent will be assigned to San Jose two thirds. Two thirds of the patent will be assigned to San Jose. One third of the patent will be assigned to New York. And I'll follow up with that also. If if that firm that has a, a base in San Jose and in New York is learning from the say in San Jose from their firm in New York, how is is that like how's that going to theoretically enter into this model about like where their capabilities reside? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so we in this model, it will not be captured directly. So ideally, to capture that. Um, we will look at inventor collaboration, for instance, between two establishments of the same corporation. It turns out that there's not a large number of these. Uh, there is, an, there is uh, some, of course, collaborations, but not a very large number. So it's not included in that model directly. Then how it is uh, teased out, otherwise a bit more indirectly, I would say, is that the um, the influence of the, the branch or the establishment is removed from the influence of the corporation. So the counts at the establishment level are not integrated in the firm level measure. Uh, meaning that, you know, you kind of have, so in these three levels of sources of capabilities, you have the establishment, you have the rest of the firm excluding the establishment, and you have the city. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, capturing direct collaborations between uh, a branch and another branch, for example, but it is measuring the influence of the knowledge stock of the other establishments on diversification of the branch level. Does anyone have any other questions for Anthony at this point? Uh, this is a very quick one, but is there a lag structure to your model? Um, yeah, so, uh, well, let's move to, um, to the model then. Um, this is this is the standard um, city level diversification. This is just to test the robustness of the data at this point. Uh, this is not new, uh, but just to show you that it's consistent uh, with previous results in the field. But yes, the density measures are lagged. Uh, so it's minus one, um, one time period. Uh, also, I, I didn't mention, but uh, so we have a sample from 2001 to 2015 broken down into uh, three-year periods. So we have five three-year periods to kind of build out this panel data. Um, so yes, there, it's a lag structure. Um, and here's the model at the city level. We're going to use the same kind of model for the establishment level as well. But again, just to test the robustness of the data. Uh, we use LOGIT in this case. I know, Betis, you mentioned that there were still debates about PLM, uh, uh, LPM, sorry and uh, Logit or Probit. In this case, we use uh, Logit because we have a lot of extreme values in our uh, independent variables that are clustered around zero. And in the LPM model that actually, that can compute, that, that can result in computing probabilities that are negative when, the, when a lot of the measures are clustered at either at the zero or at the one level, we can have, uh, predicted probabilities outside of the zero one uh, limits. So in this case, we use log logit models. We still performed uh, LPM uh, as well to test the robustness um, and, uh, and we find consistent results uh, overall. Um, but it, we, we also struggled with this a little bit. Should we use L LPM or logit? Um, yes, you wanna add something? 
Yeah, and I mean, related to that, um, I'm just looking at the question and I was just wondering if, um, did you try to include like firm uh, fixed effect or there was like a reason not to include them? Or mm -hmm. even, I don't know, uh, like a finer set of fixed effect. I don't know, I mean, just, uh, I mean, yeah, just a yeah. question, maybe it doesn't make any sense again, economically mm -hmm. speaking, so. Just... No, that's a good question um, in, in the branch. Uh, well, let me come back to this question in just one minute, all right? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to the model and I'm gonna talk about the fixed effects in a moment. Uh, but just was showing the showing this quickly to show that results are consistent with previous uh, previous studies on regional diversification. Also note that there's a significant association between the knowledge stock of neighboring regions in this model and diversification at the regional level, uh, suggesting perhaps that there's potentially knowledge spillovers between regions. But again, the problem with looking at aggregates like this is that we don't really know where these spillovers would come from. Uh, so I'll jump right now to the, the establishment level model. Um, again, we're looking at a logit model um, with our three densi lagged density measures here. And we do include two sets of fixed effects. So time fixed effects, of course, and then firm fixed effects. Uh, we had basically, we explored two alternatives in this case. We explored the unit level fixed effect, which would be the establishment fixed effect and the firm or the corporation fixed effect. Um, it is still not clear which one behaves the best. Uh, the difference is in kind of the assumption that you will make. Uh, if you take a branch fixed effects, uh, you control for heterogeneity across branches, uh, but you don't necessarily uh, account for the fact that branches within the same corporation could actually be uh, dependent. Um, or, or related. Whereas if you move up to the firm fixed effect um, level, you would assume that the heterogeneity is greater across firms than, and it's going to be greater across firms than across branches within the firm, if that makes sense. Um, so, but it's not really clear. We tested them both. Again, it's quite consistent across specifications, uh, but whether or not it's the best way to go at the unit or at the corporation level. Uh, I don't know if anybody has remarks on this, but it's still a bit puzzling for us. Does anyone want to weigh in on that issue right now? I guess, I mean, uh, I'm not messing around with your data, but my sense would be that the, the, the establishment fixed effects are going to allow the data to speak on whether there's significant heterogeneity across establishments within firms. Right, because if it's really the firm fixed effects that matter, then your establishment fixed effects within a given firm should all have very similar coefficients. Mm -hmm. So it would be essentially the same thing as the firm fixed effect. Um, I don't know, maybe also Baptiste has, because he's running you know, models much closer to that kind of specification yeah. on that as well. Yeah, and I was thinking maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe just try like uh, establishing fixed effect, but you told that the, the, I mean, the results were the same. But if you want to take into account the like uh, um, the, the the firm structure and say that there is a coalition between uh, uh, establishments of the same firm, you can also, for example, allow for uh, uh, a coalition of the error term. I um, mean, for example, you know, like cluster at the firm uh, year level, these kind of things. But anyway, I mean, if we uh, find a fixed effect to find consistent results, then again, yeah, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, the results are there, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we already clustered the standard errors at the firm level. Um, okay, well, okay, uh, but in this case, yeah. yeah, I guess you can go for the establishment fixed effect, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think, thank you for the input, yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely uh, something to think a little bit more about, but but thank you for the, for the inputs. Um, so, uh, you know, before I run out of time, uh, let's, let's jump to the results uh, here. So uh, again, so here we're looking at the uh, kind of capability sources that influence diversification at the establishment level. We can clearly see from model four that the uh, strongest uh, predictor is uh, the establishment density. So the accumulated knowledge of the plant itself. Uh, it's a large coefficient. Actually, if you look at uh, at probabilities, 
an increase in one of the density measure would mean that you have an increase of 99% uh, or almost 100% in the probability, in the likelihood of introducing uh, or developing a new RTA. Of course, these measures never go to one. They're quite small. Um, so what we're going to look at next is the margins. Uh, we're going to look at the marginal effect of perhaps an increase from the mean and what the effect on the likelihood of introducing RTA is. But you know, it, it, and despite this kind of uh, mismatch in, in scales, we can clearly see that this is the, the strongest predictor, the accumulating knowledge of the plant itself. Um, now, secondly, uh, the firm density is larger than the city density, you know, by about 75%, um, showing that, you know, what the, 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 the firm, the, the establishment will diversify in technologies that are actually much more related to what the rest of the firm is doing than to what other firms in the city uh, are doing. Um, potentially suggesting that um, the firm intracorporate knowledge spillovers might play a greater role than regional spillovers uh, in technological diversification at the establishment level. In model five, uh, we then add some kind of organizational structure thinking here, and we add an HQ dummy and interaction terms with this headquarters dummy. So it takes the value one if the establishment is a headquarters. Uh, again, the, the magnitude of the three main uh, variables of interest uh, stays relatively the same. If we look at the binary variable for the HQ more specifically, that means that if you are a headquarters, you are more likely to introduce uh, a new uh, technological specialization. If we look at the interaction effects, then um, surprisingly, uh, I think at least to me, is that for headquarters, the influence of the establishment's knowledge stock is actually smaller than for non hq plans. And same for city effect. Um, the influence of the city knowledge stock is smaller for headquarters than for non-headquarter branches. Now, my interpretation of this and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of, uh, I'm still sitting on it and trying to make sense of it, would be that in fact, headquarters actually diversify in perhaps in a more unrelated fashion, in the sense that previous and existing capabilities might be actually less deterministic in what the HQ will develop in terms of new specializations, perhaps because they distance themselves a little bit more from existing capabilities and explore new uh, technological areas. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the right imp interpretation at this point, uh, but this is, this is kind of a thought I've been experimenting with uh, it, uh, so far. Uh, so HQs might be diversifying in the more kind of unrelated fashion. Um, final, oh, sorry. Does it change the result if you exclude the HQ? Because although you consider the inventor address, it might still bias towards the address of the headquarters. So if, if we just remove HQs and, and run yeah. different models? Yeah. Yeah, it's consistent results. Yeah, uh, okay. the results are, are not changing significantly. The, re the reason why we include actually uh, the HQ and the non-HQ in the same model is that it, it allows us to test the significance of the difference. You know, so if we compare them in two models separately, we'll see two different coefficients, but we don't know if this difference is significant. Whereas if we add the dummy variable in the same model, we know that jumping from a branch to a HQ, uh, that the difference will be significant. Um, and now for model six, which is the last model I'm gonna present uh, before concluding, we add uh, here a core, dummy. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the exact details on this because my co-writer uh, worked on, on this uh, dummy variable very recently, but it is, it is an indicator of whether or not a city is centrally located in innovation networks. So a core would be a place where there's more uh, collaborations and a, a, a greater centrality in knowledge networks in the U.S. 
by adding this dummy, uh, we see that being in the core region in the United States actually increases the probability of developing a new RTA um, at the establishment level. Uh, again, some, something that we need to, to note here is that in the periphery then, uh, when you know, core is equal to zero, the significance of city is very large, uh, much larger than in other models, all right? And actually the ratio of firm density to city density switches. Um, that could be explained by the fact that peripheral cities are much more focused in terms of the knowledge stock that they have. So uh, the branches will have a much closer proximity to the smaller knowledge base of peripheral regions. Uh, hence explaining why it has a high influence on technological diversification. Um, at the, then if we look in the core, we see that this uh, city density measure actually is smaller, meaning that the, the knowledge stock of the region in core cities will have less of an influence on, on diversification than the knowledge stock in peripheral cities. Again, I think it's because that the, the peripheral cities will be more specialized and the branches in them more specialized as well. So there will be a greater proximity between the technologies that are developed and the knowledge core of the city. Uh, but again, that's a kind of a theoretical interpretation at this point. I'm gonna conclude now uh, also by saying that we are looking also at specifically at RTAs that are new to the firm. Uh, we're generating the results right now, so we'll come up with the results uh, very soon. But this is to ask whether or not, so at the establishment level, uh, the RTAs we're looking at are new to the establishment. Now we want to know at the establishment level if the RTAs are actually new to the whole corporation, uh, which would mean that the establishment has some kind of a diversification mandate in the corporation. And we want to know if the and if the measures behave in the same way, if we look at these, this new to the firm RTA. We'll contrast that to RCAs that are, or RTAs that are, same, that are the same as the rest of the corporation. So to, again, to conclude, um, you know, I think, I think what the results suggest is that both, actually both intra and extra organizational capabilities influence uh, diversification trajectories of business units, uh, but that the specific source of capabilities that act on it will depend on different factors, whether it's an HQ or a branch, uh, whether in, depending on the type of the technology that is developed, that would be the last model that I just presented that we don't have the results yet for, and the, reg the region in which the firm operates. However, despite this heterogeneity and the magnitude of the coefficients, it seems clear that the accumulated stock of the branch, the establishment itself is the most important in diversification. It is followed by the capabilities that are found in the corporation of this branch, which is uh, on average about 75% larger than that of non-firm place-based capabilities. That could be explained by the fact that valuable knowledge or capabilities that are involved in diversification process are more likely to be protected by firms. And so uh, will rather travel within intra-corporate channels instead of being kind of freely available in the region in which the unit operates. I wanna conclude with a couple of thoughts. First, we don't look directly at knowledge transfer mechanisms. Uh, I think this is definitely something we have to look at in the future in the sense that we assume that because there's a proximity uh, between knowledge stocks and uh, diversification that there's been a transfer of capabilities, but we are actually not capturing it directly. Uh, so we could do that, for example, by looking at inventor collaboration. But as I said, there's not a lot of, of these uh, Ex, uh, you know, intra corporate collaborations going on, but we might look at a sample of it just to see what's going on there. Uh, I think Betsy mentioned something that is really important as well. The turnover of employees or executives moving from one branch to another could be a specific mechanism, moving knowledge 
across space, but between the units of a single firm. So that's definitely something that needs to be in investigated further. I think this framework could be expanded to look at this from an international perspective as well. Uh, but again, if you look at the subnational level with multiple countries, there's the issue of having to deal with a lot of data. Uh, so we'll see how it can be expanded to look at international knowledge sourcing patterns. And I want to end with a thought on what um, a report that's been published yesterday by the House Committee, uh, Antitrust House Committee. And I'm asking the question, would they, will these firms uh, still increase and for how long? We know that uh, they are under, a, lo a lot of these large multi-locational firms are under investigation right now because they dominate their market so much that it could potentially hinder innovation. Uh, if you read you know, Stiglitz, for example, this is what he would argue that domination is at this point is so large that, that innovation rates are going down. Some others would say that economies of scale and scope actually foster innovation. That's a debate, but uh, I want you guys to think about it. Will, will these organizations um, keep expanding or will the US and the European government or the European Union, for example, act on it and enact these antitrust uh, laws? And if you are interested, look at the US news. Uh, there's a report out there actually asking the government to dismantle some of these firms.